All right. Well, it's noon time, so I guess we'll get started. Welcome to Waters Up, a new podcast brought to you by the Maine Water Utilities Association and the Maine Water Environment Association, where wastewater and uh, drinking water operators can earn training credits simply by listening. And I'm going to tell you in just a minute how to go about getting those credits. You are listening to our pilot episode, uh, volume one in the soon to be wildly popular series titled Waters Up with COVID and PFAS. I am your host, the self-indulgent, completely inexperienced, wannabe master, legend in my own mind, Mr. Rob Ponto. Thank you for joining us. And if you're still listening at this point, please don't leave. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank our sponsors, of course, Maine Water Utilities Association and Maine Water Environment Association, uh, as well as Tom's Water Solutions. And he helped me with this beautiful logo you see on the wall behind us and some of the technical aspects of the podcast. And I told Leanne I'd throw in a little plug for Jetsy for anyone that's listening. And, and I guess I, I should do Nui Pick as well. Um, and of course, the Brunswick Sewer District, my employer, that allows me the free time to mess around and just do podcasts all day. So I want to thank all of them. Uh, to retrieve credits, there will be a short quiz. I know nobody wants to take a quiz, but um, that's the only way we can verify that you have listened. So you will there will be a link posted in the comments on the YouTube page once this broadcast is complete and you click that link and there'll be just a three or four question quiz basically questions only someone listening would know um, and pay attention because I'll give the answers away as we go throughout the podcast um, and then you'll submit that through Maine Water Utilities Association you may have to create a free account there's no cost even if you're not a member of the association's you just create an account, sign up, um, and then we'll uh, take the quiz and then we'll make sure we, we get you your credits. So, um, so that's about it for introductions. I'd like to move on. Uh, we have today with us uh, Mr. Mike Abbott, who's just turned his camera on. Thanks, Mike. Looking very professional today. Um, how's your audio, buddy? Thank you, Rob. Good? Yeah, good. Good. I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? okay? Is that good? Absolutely great. I like the yellow background. So let me, uh, let me just tell you about Mike Abbott. He is the associate director. This is, this is a lot, I'm telling you. The associate director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention, leading the Division of Environmental and Community Health, which includes the drinking water program, health inspection, radiation control, and environmental and occupational health. He began his career with the U.S. Public Health Service in 1991, 1991, Whew. later working in the private sector as an environmental consultant in which he managed the water supply development projects and groundwater remediation investigations throughout the northeastern U.S. Abbott has a bachelor's in civil engineering from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, a master's in geology from the University of Vermont, and is currently working on a master's in public health through American Public University. Uh, Mike is also a licensed professional engineer and certified geologist in Maine. So I myself have known Mike for quite some time. Uh, our, I'm, you know, I consider him a good friend of mine and that's one of the reasons I was able to con him into coming onto this first episode. Um, and I'm sure those feelings are reciprocated. So thank you, Mike. And yes, uh, our, our 13 year old daughters have been glued at the hip basically and, and uh, best friends since birth. But you know, the Mike and I really became friends about 15 years ago um, when Mike placed a personal ad on Craigslist and my wife answered it. So um, we'll just let the audience figure out the rest of the story from there, Mike. I don't think or... we should go into details on that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, the rest is history 15 years ago. Thanks to Craigslist. <laughs> Now I have, we have my daughter has a best friend and and here's Mike on my podcast. So um, one quick question, Mike, long title. Yes. Lots of responsibilities under one job. How does does how does that happen? Do they just keep throwing things on to you or <laughs> is your job always this way? Well, uh, good question. The uh, Center for Disease Control. I mean, you all know Dr. Shaw, who, who runs the whole show there. Um, we're set. We're 
uh, I guess, divided up into several divisions. So, you know, we have a division of in, in, infectious disease control. We have a, a, a prevention division. Uh, we have a public health nursing division. And, um, and then our uh, public health emergency preparedness division. All of those have been obviously very uh, involved in the COVID-19 response. And then we have our environmental health division. So each state has an environmental health director. And um, within that, as you mentioned, we have drinking water, uh, which, uh, which we regulate the public water systems. Uh, we have health inspections. So those are the folks that go out and inspect restaurants and lodging and campgrounds and everything else to make sure they're safe radiation control program, including the state nuclear safety inspector, uh, which you know oversees the main Yankee site and, and preparedness for any kind of nuclear emergency. We have uh, within um, one program called environmental and occupational health, that's our toxicologists. So they're the really, really smart people that um, figure out you know what's dangerous for us and how much and what we should do about it. And then um, within that program is also the childhood led poisoning prevention program. So that's the, the group that responds to uh, when, when a child has an elevated blood level and uh, blood lead level, and we go in and we have, uh, we coordinate re remediation of the house, you know, lead, lead paint and, and other things like that. So that's all kind of under the environmental health umbrella. And I'm doing my best to coordinate all of that in the state of Maine. Well, I, I don't pay too much attention, but I, from my perspective, you're doing a fantastic job. So oh, well, thanks, Rob. That's really your perspective is really what counts the most. So that's kind of yeah. what I was thinking. So, uh, br Hey, Brian, you there? I am. How are you guys? I doing? Am. All right. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to our second guest now, um, Mr. Brian Cavanaugh who Brian has worked in the field of environmental protection for 32 years, holding a variety of positions in the Maine Department of Environmental Protection and briefly with the US EPA in New York City. Wow, we won't yeah, hold we, that against you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brian was appointed the Director of Bureau of Water Quality in April of 2019. He is responsible for all aspects of water quality programs at Maine DEP. Prior to his current position, Brian served for 18 years as the Director of Division Water Quality Management at the DEP, um, overseeing all regulatory and financial assistance programs for point source discharges. He held previous positions in the DEP in the pollution prevention, toxics use reduction. Oh, that's a tough one. I've dealt with those guys. Uh, small business assistance and sludge and residual utilization programs. How's that, Brian, for an introduction? Pretty good. So, I, so feel like a, I feel like a slacker next to Mike. His, his bio was really deep. Yeah, well, notice my bio was about one sentence. So, um, but, you know, I, I, I have enough qualities uh, to get myself in front of a microphone, and that's about it. Um, but anyway, Brian, you, you're hiking the 67 peaks in New England over 4,000 feet. Yeah, I am. And, and how many have you completed so far? Uh, as of Saturday, I've got 38. Oh, you got one done this weekend. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so, and just so everyone listening knows, both Mike and Brian are commissioners for Nui Pick for, for the state of Maine. Yeah. Um, but much more interesting is the uh, is that they both play guitar and sing. So if if people are paying attention, are we going to be singing on this show later or is that for another date? We'll, we'll let you go first. <laughs> you, you, go, you, you start, Rob, and we'll join in. Yeah. <laughs> Good plan. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but just so people know and pay attention, because this will be on the quiz. Um, Mike's band is called the Howligans, correct? And, uh, and Brian's band, or it's actually a duo called yeah. Hurry Down Sunshine. Correct. So Correct. people, people listening in, remember that because that will be a quiz question. So, and uh, later on, I, if we have time, I may ask you how those names came about because um, they're, they're both very interesting. And I know band names is always a fun thing to talk about where, where they originate from. So if we have time at the end, we'll, we'll bring that in. And of course, uh, Dr. Shaw is hopefully going to be joining us around 1230 time, but he's in a meeting with the governor. Yeah, apparently that's important. But 
Um, but we'll see. We'll take him when he comes on. And, and uh, if he's a little late, he's a little late, but hopefully he has some time for us. And if not, I'm sure we'll get him on the next one. Um, so with that, I guess we will get down to business. How does that sound? Um, first things I wanted to talk about was related to COVID, of course. It's you know a year and a half gone by, and it's still um, the biggest thing we all talk about. Um, current status in Maine, though, only 38 cases today, and that was the lowest since October 24th of last year. Um, what, what do you guys think about that, Mike and Brian? Are we starting to turn a corner, or how's things going? Uh, well, I'll start, uh, if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, as you said, Rob, things are definitely looking um, looking very good uh, as compared to you know m- several months ago. And um, I think we also today, I thought it was 40 cases, but 38 sounds even better. Uh, we also are down to less than 2% on our positivity rate, which is the percent of positive cases compared to the number of tests given. Um, we have, as was announced last week, last as of last Tuesday, uh, we reached a milestone of vaccinating 70% of the 12 and older population, uh, or at least them having at least one shot. And that was, that was a, a federal or presidential goal, and, and Maine was one of the first states to reach that. Uh, we actually had, at, as of last Tuesday, had the second highest um, percentage of fully vaccinated adults, and we have over 53% of the entire population vaccinated. And I think that's probably um, a big reason why we're starting to see, you know, a de- decrease in the number of daily cases, uh, just, you know, less people that are uh, uh, susceptible to the infection and less people that can pass it around. We're also getting into the warmer weather, and in Maine, um, that's when the air humidity is, is better, uh, you know, we're not we're not shut indoors with the dry air where the uh, where the um, where the disease can spread more readily, and um, and that's why I just saw an article today about in the southern part of the U.S. They're going into the part of the year that's actually more problematic because they'll be spending more indoors in air conditioning. But for us, we uh, we can let the fresh air in and we can spend more time outdoors, and that's going to also reduce the transmission rate. So yeah, things are looking very good uh, as of today. We also had administered 1.4 million doses of the vaccine in Maine uh, for a total of 700,000. We just crossed the 700,000 mark of people who have had both doses or if they've had the J and J one dose. So people who are fully vaccinated. So uh, really good progress on that. Yeah. One thing I've noticed, uh, you know, numbers were low last year at this time as well, but of course everything was, was closed up. The difference is, is now we're, we're starting to see low numbers of cases, but we're eating at restaurants and we're, we're going to our, our sports events and so forth. So big, big difference this year. Yeah. Sure. I, I would point out that one concern with that, Rob, is that, you know, I noticed the same thing this weekend driving, you know, driving around the state and, uh, um, there is some concern that there could be an uptick in cases among people who aren't vaccinated. So we may see that uh, based on everything opening up and based on Memorial Day weekend was very, very busy. I think uh, we had, I, I know I know the campgrounds were full and the roads or the highway was full on, on trying to get home yesterday. Uh, so, you know, there is, there is concern about that. Um, however, again, overall, uh, we do think things are trending in a good direction. Good, good. Um, just for just because we have a lot of wastewater operators and drinking water operators listening, um, and, it's, and this is kind of geared toward them. You know, I, I'm pretty sure we all know the answer, but um, real quick, can, you can't catch COVID by having water splashed on you. Is that is that correct? Yeah. The the, uh, um, the uh, primary transmission rate is by breathing in basically aerosolized droplets that are emitted by other people, uh, infected people into the air. Um, those, that's a way it can get directly into your respiratory system where it uh, takes root as an infection. Uh, you know, we, there's still a recommendation to sanitize surfaces and, and you know, wash your hands, do all of that stuff, but the primary transmission route is through the air. Now in, in drinking water and wastewater, I'll let Brian speak to wastewater because basically I've hogged all the talking time so far, but in, in drinking water, uh, you know, we, we asked, we were concerned about that early on uh, in the pandemic. And, you know, when you think about it, first, the, um, the, the, 
the uh, disease would have to get into uh, into the water system. Now, for wells and things like that, it's virtually impossible. The, the disease does not survive uh, for very long in the natural environment, so it wouldn't be able to, you know, travel somehow from somebody through the ground, even from like a, a subsurface wastewater system. By the time it ever reached a drinking water source, as an underground drinking water source, it, it wouldn't be alive anymore. Um, and if it went in directly into a surface water body, those obviously require disinfection. And we did learn early on through EPA and, and CD, US CDC that the that basic dis, uh, water disinfection through uh, chlorination, in most cases, um, kills the virus. So the chance of getting it through drinking or, or getting water splashed on you um, is, is, is extremely small, but I'll let Brian speak to the wastewater side of it. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Mike said. You know, it was interesting when the pandemic started back in a million years ago, it was you know, roughly March of 2020 when we started getting some calls from folks uh, asking about, you know, could they get COVID at the beach if there was a CSO or, you know, from wastewater and everything that I've seen in the literature says that it's extremely unlikely. I don't think they've detected any live virus coming in, even an influent to a treatment plant. And uh, you know, the literature states that it's highly unlikely it would survive through the, if it did even get there in the influent, uh, survive through the treatment process and certainly not through chlorination. So it seems that that risk is extremely low. And when we start talking about uh, I know you want to talk about wastewater testing, wastewater surveillance for the virus. Uh, you know, everything that we've seen is it's, they're not testing uh, infectious virus, they're testing fragments of the virus that have been uh, made it through the treatment, uh, to the treatment system, but they're not in an infectious state. Okay, well, that kind of, that kind of leads me on actually, Brian, I was, I was going to, segue into wastewater epidemiology and and uh, explain what it is and just so people know this is the next quiz question is what is wastewater epidemiology and if you wikipedia it it is a technique for determining the consumption of or exposure to chemicals or pathogens in a given population so that's a pretty generic term can you uh can you kind of bring that down into realistic terms and talk talk to me a little bit about we, what wastewater plants are doing? Sure, but I'll start with a little history of how it kind of evolved in the state. So it was back in, I think, March of 2020, once the pandemic was you know, named a pandemic, uh, there was a email sent to the governor's office from a company in Massachusetts that did this kind of testing, Biobot is the name of the company. And that filtered its way down to me at DEP. And uh, we researched it and it seemed legitimate and we got in touch with the company and uh, they were looking for contacts in the wastewater community here in Maine. And at that point, we didn't know much about sewage surveillance, but it certainly seemed like it was a legitimate technique. It's been used in the past, I think for uh, uh, other diseases, polio and uh, also tracking uh, opioids, in communities, so it's, it certainly has been used in the past for a variety of things. And so uh, we passed on information for the three wastewater associations to Biobot. We, the department didn't take a position on it at that, at that point. Uh, we tried to get the word out to facilities that this was something that could be done if they chose to, uh, but we left it to them and let uh, Biobot make direct contacts. And, and out of that, by the time we got to May, there was, five or six facilities that were doing uh, testing. Some just did it for the month of May because it was, it was a special deal at that time, could do it relatively cheaply per sample. And uh, so I think there might've been in May out of those five or six communities, there was I think 13 samples taken and two of those had detectable levels of, of the virus. Uh, again, not infectious virus, but uh, virus particles. And then it kind of evolved from there into other communities doing it longer term. Portland Water District took a, a keen interest, interest in it. Scott Furman down there was really interested in continuing on and they've continued on straight through. And I believe they're still doing it. They teamed up with uh, St. Joseph's College in Standish. There was a professor down there that took a keen interest, interest in it and they've been doing sampling 
uh, straight through. And then several other communities, Brunswick Sewer District, you guys are doing it now, right? Are you still doing it, Rob? Yeah, we've been sending samples down to St. Joe's uh, and we're going to continue at least through the month of June. But so we only did about a, an eight week run just to kind yeah. of establish a baseline and, and see if it's going to we don't really know what to do with this data. So that's, yeah. that's kind of my next question. And, and I don't know if Mike can chime in, too, is, you know, it, first of all, someone has to essentially poop the virus out. It has to travel through the wastewater system. We have to collect the sample. We have to take it down to St. Joe's. It's it's about ten days since we've we get our um, results back from the sample. So what what next? Like how how is this help or or drive a policy type decision? You know, I, I have this data, but I don't I don't know if it serves any value to me. Maybe it serves value to you know those making decisions. Well, we certainly had a lot of discussions about that, Rob, um, throughout this, and we've been keeping a close eye uh, with Brian's help on, you know, on on the results that are coming out of the systems that have been testing and reporting the results to Brian. Um, and, you know, at the community level, so at a treatment plant like Brian District, yes, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing an indication that the virus is present or prevalent in the community. And and it could potentially serve as an early warning if the if there wasn't any infections in the community and then you started seeing it, that would tell you something's going on. It may tell you when you're starting to see a decrease, uh, but it's not, it's not an inst instantaneous data point. Uh, we're actually at CDC, we're talking about, and again, with Brian's help, we're talking to um, some of the universities and actually talking about building capacity at the state lab to, to do this type of testing. But what we're looking at as a pilot uh, program is to look at the facility level, meaning rather than looking at the results from at a POTW, we'd be collecting effluent from a school or a prison or a business, um, you know, a building, basically as a long-term long -term care nursing facility. Um, and, and taking that sample twice a week and so what that what we could use that for from an epidemiological standpoint is to um you know and, and this actually already happened once at saint joseph's where they found um that the disease they found the virus in the wastewater from a dorm and then they uh started testing the the people in the dorm um, so it, it can trigger like a universal testing program so now we know somewhere in this facility, and I think we are going to start with one of our correctional uh, facilities, so a, a prison population. Within this population, someone in there at least has the disease, so that's a good indication. Let's let's test everyone, and then we can use that data, the actual clinical testing data, to um, determine if people need to isolate or quarantine. So you know we do see it as. Uh, and at least we're, 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 we're going to test that theory out in the pilot study to see if it can be used to manage um, the disease within a population. And, and, and then maybe to further answer your question, again, from, you know, at the level of the POTW, um, th this is being, well, this, this is being done all over the world. Uh, and not just for COVID, it can be used for other infectious diseases. It can be used to detect opioid use uh, in a, becoming more or less prevalent in a population. So it can be used to look, I guess, at the big picture. Okay. All right. So is there a uh, conglomerate? I'm assuming the professor at, at St. Joe, she has our info. So she must be working with some groups and, and kind of doing this kind of testing. Like I said, the, the data for the district may not you know, we already know COVID's in town. <laughs> so, um, so I, I don't know if it's going to do a lot on our end, but I'm assuming that it's going to at least help towards, towards uh, advancing the technology and, and maybe help some future populations to work around this is kind of the way we see it. Right. And I do think this, this entire, you know, pandemic and, and all the work that's gone on worldwide in this has, has helped refine the technique and refine the interpretation of the data. So, yeah. Uh, and again, it can be used to look at what's happening in the big picture at, you know, community-wide level, statewide level, worldwide level. So um, 
I, I, I do think you're right, Rob, that, that this is this is sort of being used to enhance this technology and, and make it more usable, um, hopefully in the future. Right. Yeah, there's been some good work done by the, the Water Research Foundation, the International Research Foundation, and they they pulled together experts from all over the, the world uh, that have been involved in this. They've done a couple of really great webinars uh, in terms of refining techniques, sampling techniques and analytical techniques. And you know, on a larger level, nationwide, the federal CDC is pretty interested in this and they're doing, uh, they're running a trial. I, I think their ultimate vision is to make sure we've got good standardized methods for sampling and analysis. And I, I think down the road, their vision is that all of this data would be sent to a federal repository, the Fed, federal CDC, uh, to be analyzed, and they would be following the trends and have good communication with the state CDCs, and that this would be a really uh, viable tool to use in the future to, to look at other outbreaks if that were to occur. Okay, so Brian, that kind of, you're, you're good. It's almost like you had like the agenda ahead of time because you, you keep segueing in, into my the, next had, question. Yeah, I had the questions to the test beforehand. It's good. Yeah, yeah, that is <laughs> helpful. Um, but you kind of let into it a little bit. Uh, is, is the test methods, I don't know anything about the test methods and maybe this is not the question for, for the two of you because I'm assuming you're not working in labs um, on a daily basis, but is there a way to improve the, the test methods or, or make it affordable? Like, could we get to a point where at our lab, you know, Brunswick Sewer District, we have a lab, but we don't do all testing there. We do BOD, TSS, the basic process control stuff. Um, would we be able to do COVID testing right in our own lab and then, and then send those results out to a network? I don't know that you could do that now. I mean, I'm not an expert in the analytical techniques either, but my understanding is it's fairly specialized equipment. Not every, not your routine lab is going to have it. Uh, I know I, IDEX has come out with a, a test kit to make the, the front end of it a little easier. Um, but you still need some specialized equipment to do that. Okay. So we're spent, I think it's about $400 a test right now, which, you know, it's not, it's not a huge number necessarily, but it does add up fairly quick, you know, yeah. especially if you're doing it on a weekly basis. So. Yeah. You know, I expect like anything though, over time, costs will likely come down. There's going to be more people having the capability to do it. It's going to be competitive. So you know, market forces will likely drive it down to a point where it's cheaper than it is now. Okay. Well, I hope you're right. I hope I'm right on that. Uh, so let's kind of just move on to effects on the water and wastewater industry. And just first off, if either of you know of any, um, like where the pandemic has actually affected drinking water quality or wastewater effluent quality, because whether it's because of worker shortages or, or some other reason, I think Mike touched on it earlier, it's not really gonna spread as a, through the water source. So I think that's okay. But um, have you heard of anything from other towns or districts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think our, our one thing we kept a close eye on and we were concerned about from the beginning was, you know, what happens if an entire crew, and I know you've had to deal with this at your workplace, um, the same concerns, um, Rob, is what happens if an entire crew, um, you know, gets affected with COVID and, and, and cannot work. Um, I know some, um, some drinking uh, water, municipal water systems and wastewater systems, I'm sure, uh, tried to cohort their crews so that if, uh, if one, they kept, you know, kept crews separated. So if one crew gets sick, the other one's available to, to fill the key functions. Uh, we did have in a couple of our small regulated public water systems. We did have um, a couple cases where it, it was down to, you know, one or two people running the plant. Um, in one case, um, the the operator ha was, was home quarantining or isolating because he had COVID, but was able to monitor the plant uh, functions remotely, but that's not, um, that wasn't quite good enough. So uh, he ended up reaching out to another small water system nearby and they provided someone to check on the equipment on a regular basis to make you know so we had eyes on what was going on um, you know so through mutual aid like that and and through some good planning and and you know 
symptom screening and all the stuff that ever, all the businesses are using throughout the state to try to try to minimize um, you know impacts to their staff. Um, we you know all the water systems. I could you know I could speak for the water systems. I'll let Ryan uh, weigh in on the wastewater plants, but they were all able to keep functioning. I'm not aware of any you know water quality or or water delivery issue that um, that resulted because of because of COVID. Um, and that's, but that's just thanks to the, you know, the hard work of the professionals in that field. Yeah. Okay. So th same on the wastewater side. And I'd say kudos to folks in the, in the wastewater profession, really, they, it was tremendous. I mean, the work is always important, but people just really stepped up in this right off the bat. And as Mike said, a lot of folks, you know, with the larger crews, they split them in two and kept people apart. And uh, we did have, a, a few facilities where we heard that, you know, they were small facilities to begin with, with not a lot of staff and, you know, they got down to pretty low levels, but, but everybody made it through pretty well. You know, there was no serious impacts to water quality, if, if any. Uh, and again, that's just the tremendous job that everybody in the profession did. I can't say enough about how, how well they, they made their way, way through this. And, you know, one of the things Mike and I did early in this back in the, March of last year, we, I think we had a mindset to kind of shift from a regulatory mode to, you know, assistance and sharing information and communication and what can we do to, you know, working together with everybody to keep things, the wastewater flowing and the drinking water being treated, you know, and so we had uh, weekly calls with the three associations and uh, the Warren and Jetsy and we were just sharing information and talking about things like staffing issues and supply chain and the great toilet paper crisis and the non-flushables that were going down the drain and causing problems. But, uh, you know, all of, it, all of it worked out, trying to get PPE for folks, you know, all of that. And it, uh, I think everybody just did a great job and, uh, you know, kudos to everybody in the profession. Yeah, I would certainly agree with that. And, you know, I know uh, both of you are, work for regulatory agencies or, or Mike did at one time. And, but, you know, I never never really see the DEP as, as a regulator. It's, it's always been more assistance focused. And, you know, anytime, you know, I, I tell anyone listening, you're always better off to reach out and ask for help than to have to deal with an issue later on down the road. So, um, I, I appreciate that. And, and I can say both your, your staff, the staff at the DEP and, and everyone we've been working with has been great through this as well as other agencies, you know. Um, but yeah, keep your keep your supply closets full because you, you never know when things are going to be short. And uh, we've certainly seen we, we used to get about one plug up a year, maybe in our in at the sewer district. I mean, pretty, pretty good system we have. Um, and I'd say this year is about a dozen plug ups yeah. and directly related to non flushables. It, yeah. it was all wipes. Um, so yeah, that, I could do a whole show on that. I probably should do a whole PR address and, and use that as our sponsorship as well. But um, so we're kind of wrapping up with COVID though. Um, you know, the last, last questions I wanted to ask you was when would Maine be fully opened up, but I don't, I don't think I need to ask that question because from the time I wrote this to time of this podcast, I would say that we are pretty well opened up. Are there any restrictions though that, that we should still know about or that operators, should, you know, are we missing? Cause when I read it, it's basically go out and have a good time, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's the exact wording, but um, yes. Yeah, so uh, it's, you're still required to maintain social distance and wear face coverings in schools. Uh, I think childcare settings, and then on public transportation. Um, and then I think the other thing that we would ask from the perspective of the CDC is just that, you know, one thing you'll notice if you walk into different businesses, restaurants, they're sort of um, able to, you know, technically people who are not vaccinated do not have to wear face coverings uh, inside, but there's no real, you know, policing or enforcing of monitoring of who is and who isn't vaccinated. So it's kind of up to the individual business or uh, any establishment, how they want to manage that. So we're just asking people to respect, you know, if, if the business asks you to wear a face covering, just wear the face covering. If you see some people wearing the face covering, it doesn't mean they're not vaccinated and it doesn't mean that they're being overly cautious, you know, and, and, um, 
because they are vaccinated. Just respect, let people do what they want to do. Um, and, and again, respect the, the wishes of, of those around you. You know, it, it, it um, it's not going to hurt to be a little extra cautious as we hopefully see this thing completely disappear. Uh, and um, that's, you know, that's sort of the perspective, uh, the message we're trying to get out there is just be respectful. Uh, but yes, if you're, you know, you're outside or you're not, you're, you're in a business that doesn't re require it and you're vaccinated, it's going to be pretty hard for you to catch the virus or to spread it to anyone else. So that's great and have a good time. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, I'm the last sentence there. And I heard that. That's what I was paying attention to. So, um, so we're up, we're past 1230 hour. And I do need to announce that Dr. Shaw is not going to be making it today. And, um, you know, I, I was a little hesitant even to put his name on the, uh, on the intro, just because we know he's a busy guy and these kinds of things are going to come up. But, um, but he did say he would, he would try to make time for either a future episode or, or uh, hopefully he'll make a guest appearance at some point. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I can say Rob that he, he genuinely intended to be here today. He is the busiest guy I've ever known and has way, way too many commitments on his time all the time, but he did yeah. um, offer to, to do a, a future podcast. So you should take him up on that. He will do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I will try to, uh, I'll let people know on this page and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there and, and, uh, and Mike, I do appreciate you trying to, to work with him and, and get him on here as well. We know it's, it's been tough for everyone. So, um, busy schedules, but, um, so anyway, uh, we'll, we'll ask just so people know quiz question. I think everybody already knows, but his, uh, his favorite soft drink is diet Coke, right? I mean, the guy, the guy loves it. So, um, I will bring him on a podcast later on and I will ask him because in my opinion, diet Coke is as much of a threat to our public health as, uh, COVID, um, and PFAS. So, um, so I want and he will not that. disagree with you on that. <laughs> right. Right. But we all have our things, right? We, there's, there's, it's what gets us through the day and you work those high stress jobs. So we'll give them a little bit of a pass. Um, and then this is my wife's, uh, t-shirt on the back wall here that I found. So keep calm and listen to Dr. Shaw. She bought that back in March of, of 2020. So, um, words to live by right there. Uh, I do want to take a minute and just thank our sponsors again. Uh, Maine Water Utilities, uh, Bruce and, and Cindy, they've been helping and, and gave, gave me all the resources, whatever they needed to try to make this podcast a go. Um, and of course, Maine Water Environment Association uh, as well. They'll be, you know, hopefully looking for sponsorship and Phil, Phil Tucker, our, our president's going to join us at the end and, and just uh, say hi. Um, and then of course, Tom's Water Solutions is a, a couple of Tom's over there. And I, I think I can't remember the other gentleman's name but the the it's a family affair and they do a great job helping with training and so forth and then leanna jetsy actually sent me a little chat um Nui pick and jesse has a class on sampling and uh epidemiology history coming up on june 24th so if you want to learn more about um uh wastewater epidemiology check out jetsy's class offerings on june 24th and then RCAP Maine has a number of other classes as well um, throughout the month of June. So, so check those things out. And then, of course, uh, the Brunswick Sewer District, uh, again, for giving me the time. And uh, Mike and Brian, even, even though, you know, to me, you guys are the heroes. We all love Dr. Shaw. Um, but you, you're the ones that are, are pulling the load for this show and, uh, and carrying the weight. So I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time and working with me last week on the, on the pilot episode. So um, so thanks to everyone there. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if either you have any, any shout outs you want to say, you want to say hi to your mom or anything like that. I mean, this is a big deal. So I just yeah, want to say when, when you're syndicated, Rob, and you're making a lot of money, don't forget about us. All right. Okay. All right. You got yeah. to start. The pilot okay. episode could be like a collector's item someday. Yeah. 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 I'm sure this will be float. You know, this will probably be the first video shown on Mars, you know, in, in the future or something. So, um, 
let's let's have a little fun uh both avid outdoors people uh brian not in as much as uh, mike and i are both pretty uh pretty serious hunters but mike is a uh mike is also a hiker and uh he does some in uh or there's a backpacker i believe backpacking is overnight hiking is day trips is that that's correct brian yeah yeah so give me give me something um that you've learned while hunting or hiking that helps you in your job on a daily basis at work. And, and I don't care whoever wants to go first here. Um, help me out. Throw me. Some, how does hunting help you in your regular life? Hunting? Um, well, I, I, you know, it, it helps you grow accustomed to repeated failure. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think uh, the way I would see it helps as, as, uh, and I'm sure you'd agree, Rob, is, is it teaches you persistence. Um, yeah, you know, um, we've, uh, we've, as hunters, we've all had the, you know, the time where we walked out in the woods on the first day of the season and everything's worked out just like we thought it would and been successful and thought, wow, that's easy. I think a lot of people might say that about golf too. Like, you know, you, you hit the ball and it goes in the hole and it's like, geez, this isn't hard. But then, uh, if you stick with it, you'll realize that it not, it very, very seldom works out the way you think it's going to on the first try. So I think, you learn to be per persistent, keep thinking about ways to improve what you're doing and, and, and don't give up on what you're doing. And, um, and, you know, keep in mind what, you, you know, really what, what are your goals and, and also um, make sure you don't stop enjoying what you're doing. I think that's one of the most important things, you know, it, it, you can't take everything so seriously that, um, that it's no longer fun. It can't just all be about accomplishing objectives. I think, uh, you know, you got to enjoy, when you're out hunting, enjoy the, enjoy nature and the people you hunt with when you're at work, you know, enjoy what you're trying to accomplish to protect public health and improve public health in Maine. Um, enjoy the people you're working with and enjoy the, the, pro, the, the process and, um, and stay positive. Yeah, that's a great answer, Mike. I, I feel like you actually put some thought into that. That's really good. I do uh, think about hunting occasionally. You can ask my wife about that. Yeah. yeah, I could ask my wife about that. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, Brian, what about hiking? Same kind of thing or, or how do you it, it relate is, it to? Your it is the same kind of thing, you know, uh, in, in both it's good to set goals and have a plan and uh, but more than anything, I think, you know, keep going. You know, yeah. sometimes at work you get bogged down in these things that you, you think are never going to end, you know, just incredibly controversial projects or things that you think are just... It just they consume you for months and months, sometimes years, and you think you're never going to get through it, and you do. And you know, I think about that sometimes when I'm hiking. It's kind of a metaphor for life. You know, you sometimes it's hot and it's buggy, or it's muddy, or it's wet, or it's raining, and it and it kind of sucks when you're going through that. But you just keep going, and then you, you dig in and you get through it. And uh, you know, later on, you catch a view at the top and you catch your breath, and it all works out. You know, it. Uh, you, you think these things, you, the tough parts never again, never going to end, but it does. You just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So what, how, what's your goal, Brian, for this year? How many of those peaks do you want to get in? Uh, I got a whole bunch in New Hampshire. I'm hiking in New Hampshire now. So there's 48 in New Hampshire and I got 24 done. Uh, I want to get most of those done, but uh, I can't get them all done this year. And I want to finish up next year on the presidential range with my daughters and so I'll, I'll save, I'll get most of them done, but save maybe uh, five or six for next year. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize there, Brian, that you had been on 207 as well when I went and did a little search and I actually got to yeah. hear some of you singing, and, you know, pretty, I've heard Mike sing plenty of times, um, you know, and uh, love Sorry, Rob. It, so. <laughs> what? I didn't, I didn't know you are going to put a plug in for us, but the 207 thing was interesting. We played at this club, Cadenza, which is a great little club in Freeport that people have never been there. And uh, 207 asked us to come on to kind of do a plug that. And that was like last year, just before the pandemic was maybe, I don't know, January or something of last year, February. So we did our thing and they aired it once and that was great. Then we played, forgot all about it. And then I keep, I keep getting calls from people like every two months, somebody says, hey, I saw you on 207, I saw you on 207. Because of the pandemic, they don't have anybody coming into the studio for the last year. So I think they go, uh, let's haul out these two guys again. We'll play them. 
play them one more time. Well, I'd like to see the Halligans on 207 sometime soon, Mike. And, and I do have, uh, you know, um, I got plenty of things I could share and pull up here if, if you want me to try to embarrass you a little later on. Or No, I, I think you embarrassed me enough with the first uh, Craigslist um, item. But um, we did have our first practice in, since the beginning of the pandemic last week. So. Excellent. We're, we're, get, we're getting ready for 207 someday. All right. Well, <laughs> I hope to hear you play somewhere later this summer, even if it's just on a back deck somewhere. So well, I'll endorse the Halligans because you played it. You sent me a clip, Rob, last week. And uh, yeah, you guys are good. You guys got a great sound. Great sound. <laughs> I mean, Thanks. Thanks. I'm not going to lie to you, but Tequila and Bridesmaids may be the best song title ever. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's been running through my head for the last four days continuously. So thanks good. for that. Good. Yeah. That's yeah. catchy as good. Yep. Um, did you write that one? I did, yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, he's also a, a songwriter, folks. So pretty impressive. impressive. Um, all right. So I guess we, we ought to get back to business. We've got a good idea. Yeah. Minutes <laughs> left in this show. Um, and then, uh, you know, so let's let's talk a little bit about PFAS because that's also on everyone's mind, especially in the water and, and wastewater industry. And um, you know, of course, the sludge spreaders are all getting blamed for causing problems here and so forth. But um, but let me just ask. I mean, we see something like this every every few years. I was you know uh, uh, I was talking with our old treatment plant supervisor who had worked at the district for 40 years. I was chatting with him last week and he, he was giving me reminders about all the different times, you know, first it was mercury. Um, and then we had dioxins and that scare came along and then kind of, I guess it's not out of the blue, but uh, PFAS kind of reared its ugly head fairly quickly last spring and it, it's led us down this road. And, and now that's all we talk about. We don't even talk about mercury anymore. Um, so how, how dangerous is PFAS and why is it the, the topic of everyone's concern right now? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I am looking forward to the day when we're not talking about PFAS. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure everybody at DEP is too. Uh, so, so PFAS, you know, I, I mean, in a way, I think what you're saying makes sense or what your operator says is that, you know, it is, it is the contaminant of the day. It is, um, I, I think what makes it, PFAS particularly difficult to deal with is um, its persistent, persistence in the environment. Um, that's why it's, they're called forever chemicals. They don't really degrade or break down very easily. Uh, once it's in the water, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to go away um, until it's, unless it's removed through treatment. They can be removed through uh, granular activated carbon and some other methods. Uh, it, PFAS does have a whole suite of potential health effects. A lot of that's still kind of being studied. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a toxicologist or a, or a clinician, so I don't want to come across as knowing a lot about that, but it's been linked to um, increases in cholesterol, a lot to do with liver, uh, liver enzymes. Um, they've linked it to decreases in birth weight. They've linked it more recently to um, uh, resistance to, or, or, or reduced efficacy of vaccines. Um, they've linked it to increased risk of kidney and testicular cancer. So it has a whole suite of, of potential health effects. And um, we, you know, although it's, you know, really in the front right now, we started looking at this several years ago. Um, EPA did a round of testing throughout the country on public water systems in 2013 through 2015. And that's how we found out about the well in Arundel, part of the Kennebunk, uh, Kennebunk Port and Wells Water District, uh, and the Stone Ridge Farm, and that was in the news quite a bit. Um, that was that was related, we believe, to to biosolid spreading um, of from several sources. The levels there that we saw were in the well weren't even above the current health advisory of 70 parts per trillion, but the district still made the proactive choice to treat that well. It ended up being a million and a half dollar project, um, not to mention the annual costs to recharge the carbon filtration. So this isn't a cheap thing to get out of the water. Uh, we started testing in 2015 and 2017, I believe. We did two rounds throughout the state of Maine looking at public water systems near, especially smaller ones near biosolid spreading sites, airports, 
landfills and places like that. We didn't find a lot. We found a couple, we had some detections, but we didn't find a lot of high levels. Um, and then more recently, uh, it was actually found through testing of milk that showed low levels of PFAS um, in, a, in a, you know, combined milk at the dairy. And then they traced it back to one farm in Fairfield. And that's where we found levels that were beyond anything we would have ever expected in the milk, in the water, in the ground. And that was from biosol, we believe from biosol spreading from over decades, really, that uh, from a source that had a high, uh, I think I heard over 50% of the flow into that plant was from an industry, industrial facility that used a high levels of PFAS in their process. So now now it's shifted to an investigation of impact of private wells, um, not, not the public water system, but many private wells. I believe DEP, who's been you know just phenomenal in this, they've put all their a ton of their resources to this, um, have tested almost uh, two or three hundred wells already, um, targeting the ones that seem to be most at risk. And I, I know a lot of them, I think around 50 percent have have ended up with high levels and some very, very high levels. Um, we're putting in a DEP is putting in treatment filters for those people. And then we're we're discussing very actively all the time now uh, what we're going to do to address this in the long run. And a lot of it comes down to uh, resources, staff, and money, and a lot of money for treatment, for running new public water lines, for potentially relocating um, people where we can't we can't um, create a safe living condition. So it's it's a it's a big picture problem for the state, um, but it's also happening all through the country and the world. So um, this isn't you know you mentioned some things like the MTBE. I remember that was big back in the '90s, um, and then. Uh, mercury and dioxin related, uh, especially to impacts in the rivers. But this is sort of, it can show up here and there and everywhere. Um, and because it's in so many products that we all use and has been for years, it's also, it's not limited like some contaminants to a specific industry or a specific uh, activity. It's, it's here and there and everywhere. And um, I think uh, a lot of the discussion has been about trying to cut it off at the source, meaning reduce the use of these chemicals in production. Uh, and that's hopefully going to help, but we still have a problem on our hands, no doubt about it. Yeah, um, if, if I could, I'll just add, you know, the things you mentioned, Rob, mercury and dioxin, you know, I think it's easy to get jaded, you know, of, of the, the chemical of the day, but, you know, those things were serious and legitimate and they took a lot of attention and they were addressed, you know, as a society, we address those things, you know, we, we took measures to control mercury through a variety of ways. We, there was changes in technology in the paper industry to reduce dioxin. And, and this is the same sort of thing, you know, it's, it's come to the forefront, it's a serious issue, and it's appropriate to devote resources to it and attack it from a variety of angles and, you know, reduce its use in products, track it, and, and to address it. And, you know, hopefully years down the road, we'll look back and say this was another thing that was identified, but it was addressed appropriately. And it certainly is a serious issue for people that have it in their well and their drinking water well. And so, you know, our department and Mike's department is devoting you know, a lot of time appropriately to, to address it. I'd also mention just quickly that the Department of Ag is, is heavily involved yes. in this yep. because the impact on the farmers who, you know, spread this stuff thinking it was uh, beneficial use of 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 a waste are now in situations where they can't use their land anymore. So it's a real right. impact on them. Um, but we're all working on it. No, that's, that's very clear. I mean, it, it's, it was obvious when, <laughs> when we first got notification about PFAS and we, the Brunswick sewer district, we had already stopped our field application of sludge um, before, before we were forced to. Um, so we didn't have a huge effect on our operation, but uh, you know, the, the way that they went about it, I mean, not everyone's going to agree with it, but um, I think, I think the seriousness was quickly realized and everybody jumped on board and said, listen, we got to get to the bottom of this. And, and I would agree that uh, I think the biggest element is, is uh, to keep it out of the products that we're using. It's the, I don't think we're going to see solutions on the back end or at least affordable solutions on the back end. And it's one of those things that I've only been in this industry for 10, 11 years now. And, 
it, it's interesting that wastewater treatment plants are, are thought of as polluters. Like we're the ones with the permit and we're the ones creating the problem, but it, it's really not us. It's our, we're cleaning the water up as much as we can and trying to find ways to deal with it. it it's the public, the general public and myself and, and everybody listening included. We're, we're all polluters. Um, and that's understood, I think, you know, and a couple of things that are happening. It's uh, so for the first time this year, there's going under the EPA's toxic uh, reporting uh, re requirements, PFAS will be reported. Those reports are going to be coming in for the first time in July of this year. So we'll be able to it's we'll be able to see as a starting point where it's used in various uh, manufacturing. And there's a bill being I heard this session in our legislature, if, if it's a product that will be sold in Maine and PFAS is intentionally added, that will need to be reported starting in 2023. And there may be the authority to, uh, you know, control classes of products that have it. So th there's a variety of things happening to address what you just said. It's not the PODWs, you don't manufacture it. It's, it's discharged to you. So we got to get it at its source, ideally. Yeah. Um... So uh, let's talk about, uh, can we talk about regulations? Are there any new regulations for, for at least on the drinking water and the wastewater side or, or yeah. is that still up in the air? Yeah, so uh, in drinking water, the uh, EPA still has a health advisory of 70 parts per trillion for two PFAS compounds out of, there are many, um, but those two PFOA and PFOS, PFOA and PFOS, I won't say out the full name, but, um, that's a health advisory. It's not a regulatory level. So, um, but uh, through this current legislation, legis legislative session, uh, there were three bills introduced to regulate PFAS and public drinking water. And it is, it appears that the, the one that went through the committee and is going to the full legislature and will likely be enacted uh, will require public water systems that are community systems or non-transient non-community systems like schools to uh, test by the end of 2020, um, 2022, yes, by December 31st, 2022, we'll have to test for six PFAS compounds. Now, when you when you send a sample out for analysis, you actually get results for, well, it's, it's increasing each year, about 12 to 15, but um, we'll be testing specifically for six PFAS compounds, including P, PFOA and PFOS, and then four more. Uh, we will have an interim standard of 20 parts per trillion uh, combined. So, uh, and then if, if, if you exceed that, you have to move toward, the public water system would have to move toward remediation and that'd be a public notification requirement. And you would also be required to test quarterly until um, levels were brought down below 20. If you have any detections, you have to test annually. And then um, in Parallel with that going on with this new sampling requirement, um, the, uh, the department, the, uh, our CDC uh, will be working on rulemaking to establish a maximum contaminant level. So that will actually give us a, a regulatory limit. And we did this for MTB back in the day. Um, most, of the, most of the maximum contaminant levels that drinking water systems have to adhere to are, are federal standards but Maine has a uh, state standard for MTBE and we'll, we will be assuming this legislation goes through, which it very likely will, we will be moving toward a uh, MCL for, for PFAS. And they, that could end up being individual limits for each compound, or it could be a combined. Um, I kind of see the value in going toward individual because who knows five years from now, there may be two or three others that come up as, as, uh, as the, well, the contaminant of the day that are that we need to add into the mix. So, hopefully not. But that's where we're going. So, the public water regulated public water systems. If you're a community system or a um, NTNC, will uh, will in the near future be required to add PFAS to your to your required sampling. Okay, well, I'm glad I'm not on the drinking water side of things right now, but Brian, you, you got anything to relate from the from a legislative standpoint with regards to the wastewater side of, of PFAS regulations? I, I would say nothing legislatively this session. You know, EPA is the one that typically sets uh, ambient toxic levels that we use in our toxics program for wastewater dischargers. So 
because they've got the horsepower to do the science behind that. That hasn't been established yet. They're working on it. You know, realistically, that may be a couple of years away. And, you know, what they do is they'll develop an ambient criteria looking at aquatic impacts and also human health impacts through the pathways of fish consumption and uh, drinking and water, drinking and receiving water. Uh, so once that is, that is established, uh, I think, you know, then certain regulatory actions will take place under our toxics program. But we are looking at DEP. You know, our primary focus has been on assisting the Bureau, Bureau of Remediation and Waste Management on the contaminated sites. Uh, we've been helping them, but we are starting to plan out what's appropriate on the water end, a variety of things, particularly uh, ambient sampling. We've done fish tissue sampling for the last two years under our toxics program, the uh, surface water ambient toxics program. Uh, we're looking at expanding that potentially into some ambient sampling. We're, and we're discussing effluent sampling, whether that makes sense at this point, and if so, where and, and how, uh, and then what to do with the data you know, once we have it. So we're discussing all of those things. I'd say it's really an evolving issue. You know, this is one of these things that is rapidly evolving. You know, month to month, it's changing. The science is evolving. The regulatory aspect is evolving. We're learning more and more. So it's one of these things. Stay tuned. You know, next month, it's going to be different than this month. All right. Well, we'll stay tuned. And that, you know, that, uh, that gives me a reason maybe to have another show in a month or so, right? We can talk about whatever the latest changes are. So we are we are up against the hour and I think, you know, there's more things that we could talk about and we can certainly get deeper into some of those topics, but I, I am going to try to wrap it up, keep it to the hour. And, and I'm going to ask, since I put both of you on the spot, um, since Dr. Shaw was unable to join us and we still easily filled the hour, uh, would you two be interested in coming in and on and, and playing second fiddle to, to Dr. Shaw if, he, if we're able to set one up with him in the future? Sure. Sure, that's what I do on a daily basis. Yes. <laughs> so Mike will be a regular day at work, but I'd like to have him on and, and maybe even uh, reiterate some of these topics that we already discussed, but I'll, we'll probably come up with a few other things as well. And, and uh, you know, so Mike, I'll get together with you and we'll sure. find a time. And for our listeners here that are, are sadly disappointed to only see myself and Brian uh, um, and Mike, then uh well, we're going to add Phil. So Phil is nice looking fella to help come in here in a second. Um, but yeah, so thank, thank you both so much for coming on. I, I wealth of knowledge. It's, I, I actually was a little bit nervous for this, but I have the easy part. I just got to ask the questions and, and you have to be the expert. So I really, really appreciate it. I don't know if uh, any closing remarks from either of you, things you want to add. I just say thanks. This was uh, this was good. I, I learned a lot listening uh, to the conversation here, and um, you know it's it's good to it's good that people are interested in this. Uh, we we're seeing you know a lot of changes um, coming at us. You know, coming out of this pandemic, we're gonna we're we're running right into a lot of stuff that affects the industry. So, and 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 the regulatory side of things. So, uh, fortunately, there's also being there's, there's also some financial resources being thrown this way. Um, for the first time in a while. So that may help us get through some of these challenges, but um, you know, I'm glad, glad for the interest and, and, and looking forward to all the work ahead. Yeah. Th and thanks again, Mike. Brian, uh, how are you doing? Good. I'll just say uh, once again, kudos to everybody in the wastewater community for your great work through the pandemic. Thanks to everybody. And uh, I'll put a plug in for an idea for another show is uh, infrastructure funding, as Mike mentioned. So this uh, is money, already available out of Washington under the ARPA Act. There you go. There you go. <laughs> talk about that soon. Uh, and also, you know, as infrastructure bills are being debated, the water and wastewater infrastructure bill is being debated, the larger jobs plan bill is being debated, there's potentially money there for infrastructure. So people should be paying attention to that, talking to their representatives if they're so inclined, because it's a good climate right now for money to come down out of Washington, and we should be ready and advocating for that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. And uh, just to let you know, we had about, uh, it looks like there's about 60 listeners listening live. So that's not, not a terrible number. Um, and then, you know, I expect we'll get another hundred or so in the, in the next couple of weeks that we'll probably watch the recorded version. So make sure you share it with your friends, let everyone know, because um, you know, if this gains some steam, it, it can become a regular thing. And it's, I think it's a great way to train people 
Um, we did have some comments. I got a you know, thank you from a few people, Dustin, Paula, uh, Jason, uh, Nikki, everyone said great job, really enjoyed it. Uh, my role model and personal idol, uh, Brian Tarbuck, uh, just wanted to point. <laughs> I almost said it without laughing, but uh, but no, he he certainly is. He's yours model. too. He's your role role model too. Wow. Yeah, that, I think that's not why we get along so well. Uh, but he, you know, he makes the point that removing PFAS from water is uh, is pretty easy, and I guess relatively inexpensive. But on the wastewater side, because you can't run it through filters. Um, is, is much more intensive and much more costly. So I think he's he's driving that point home of let's keep it out of the sources, and that's going to be the easiest thing to do from a wastewater standpoint. So, um, so yeah, we had some people on, and uh, I thought it was great. And um, and thanks again for coming. Oh, and Phil, you're my last one on there. You want to join us for a second there, Phil? Sure. Yeah. So. Uh, so I got Mawia to sign off as a sponsor. I threw him some full sponsorship. Can you give a little plug for the organization? Uh, sure. Uh, but before I do that, just let me say thank you, everyone on here. This was, uh, this was great today. Really well done. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Rob, for putting this together. Uh, and who doesn't consider Brian Tarbock their role model? <laughs> right? Uh, no, but seriously, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Mawia. Uh, I first got introduced to Mawia back in 2013 uh, and actually was dragged to a uh, executive committee meeting to meet a few people. I didn't know who any of them were at the time. Uh, later that year, I went to a convention, which was my first convention. Uh, somehow I got talked into at that convention joining the collection system committee. Um, you know, then on to the convention committee and you push the whole thing forward to eight years later and here I am sitting as president of the association. Uh, so it certainly has opened some doors for me. Uh, I'm getting ready to, at the end of this year, take over as superintendent of the York Sewer District. So and I've met a ton of great people over the years. Uh, so great organization, great association, uh, very, very happy and honored to be a part of it. Well, thank you, uh, Phil, and th thanks for coming on. And um, and I would agree with you. I mean, getting involved and in, in the more you do with the organization, the more you get out of it. So, um, and there are a few nice people in there, and you know, there's a few people like myself as well. So it, it can be fun. Um. Uh, the uh, you're, you're looking at the comments, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little bit. Um, so, and then I do have. Uh, did the screen share work there? Um, Dr. Shaw did join us here for just a minute. I had to share this photo. This, my aunt actually painted this. This is an oil point painting by Shelby Krauss. Um, pretty talented. She also did Dr. Fauci. Uh, Very good. So I just wanted to make sure I threw that up there on the screen. I was waiting for the doctor to come on and, and show him. But, um, but anyway, I fit that in at the end and then, um, uh yeah i guess uh i guess that's all i got so thanks again hey mike you don't mind if i end it with a little tequila and sunshine do you do it do it uh, let's see if it sorry i was on mute but do what you have to do rob yeah, do it. <laughs> or tequila and bridesmaids sorry i hurry down sunshine tequila and bridesmaids <laughs> I'm, I'm yeah i want to hear some of brian's music i no, haven't no. heard it yet play mike's stuff that's a rock. Yeah, it's, it's odd 207. You can find it there. All right. Um, and I, I got it playing here in the background, but I have too many uh, things going on that I, I think I've muted myself and, and messed up my sources. So anyway, that's go okay. find <laughs> the Keelan Bridesmaids. Fantastic song. Go, go find it after this. I'll put a link in the uh, comments on the YouTube page. Um, thanks again, everyone. And uh, I think we're going to be back because this was fun. It was, it was a great time and, and I really, really appreciate it. So. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. Take Thanks care, everybody.